Welcome to Inside Hawaii Real Estate on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today's show is about factors that will affect Hawaii's real estate market and industry. Our guests for this show are otherwise hosts, Will Tanaka, a real estate professional, and Leone Lamb, Better Homes and Gardens Real Estate. So let's see, what are we going to talk about today? But first, who are we going to talk to? Uh, I guess the first chore, Will, can you introduce Leone? Be nice. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you very much for uh, inviting us and for this awesome opportunity to uh, talk story with you, Jay. So we really appreciate you. And, Absolutely. Um, yeah, thank you. And so Leonie Lamb, so she's my amazing wife and business partner. She's a broker and she's been in real estate for over 20 years. And on a personal level, I mean, she's like the deepest, most caring person when it comes to business. She's type A, strategic. Our clients love her because she's a straight shooter, analyzes data, recommends pricing. At the same time, she shows how much she genuinely cares about our clients. Okay, it, okay, okay. We only yeah. have half an hour, Will. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Leone, why don't you introduce Will? Well, Jay, earlier you were asking, you know, what it's like and if it's beneficial for our clients, the fact that Will is an attorney and that he has the attorney background, the legal background. And so um, I'll say that, you know, Will, working with him, I think our consumers or the clients that we service, they greatly benefit from his legal background, but they also greatly benefit because he used to run a title and escrow company. He was also in-house for another title and escrow company. So his Knowledge in that area is vast, and it's so helpful to our clients, to to myself as his business partner. As a husband and wife team, working and living with an attorney, not always the most fun. <laughs> <laughs> Some people would wonder, you know, it would be in partnership together and be married together. Wow. I, I, I want to compliment you guys on being able to do that. All right. <laughs> Who are your clientele, Will? Um, what kind of clientele do you represent? What kind of, kind of uh, uh, clientele do you seek? What kind of clientele from where? Uh, what kind of properties? Tell us about your practice. From you know professionals, attorneys, doctors, uh, finance, uh, financial professionals, to first-time home buyers, uh, investors, and people who are coming back home. So we do help. Um, uh, a myriad of you know family members, couples, individuals, and professionals. And Leone, what 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 kind of um, a market do we have right now? Because you guys are in touch with it. Uh, you know, you have to stay akamai about what's happening up or down. Um, so, what's it like right now here in Hawaii? I guess you guys are mostly into residential. Uh, tell tell us how the residential market is. So in residential right now, you know, it is summer, which is traditionally a busier time. You'll see more listings coming on. That is what we're seeing. In terms of sales, you know, for single family homes, we're kind of tracking similar to where we were last year, you know, year to date this year in 2024. We're going to end this month and see what it looks like mid-year. But right now it's, you know, about 7% actually above in closed sales where we were last year. But then if you roll it back to 2022, you know, we're at least 30% off. So 30% less. So the market, mm. that's why you're hearing people saying like the market is down. For us, we've been fortunate because what you're seeing in our market here is people who are selling and oftentimes it's because they need to sell. So we've kind of become sort of experts in the trust sale space or in the probate sale space. And so a lot of sellers that are selling, it's because someone passed away in the family. So we're helping families, you know, market their home for sale so that they can divide the proceeds, et cetera, and close out the estates. So there's a lot of that type of activity happening. And then, you know, from the condo perspective, condo sales are kind of flat from where they were last year, but way down, you know, almost close to 40% down from where they were back in 2022 around this time. And that's because condos are having such extreme issues right now. There's so many issues with Hawaii condos, Oahu condos in particular, especially the aging ones. There's all kinds of issues with condos with respect. What do you mean to issues? You mean issues that require repair, renovation? What kind of issues? Repairs are needed, really needed on the aging condos. Insurance has become a, an incredibly difficult issue for anyone that's trying to buy a condo with a loan. 
And so that's still possible. People are able to still buy condos with loans, but oftentimes they're being pushed over to portfolio types of loans, which require a much higher down payment than the usual 20% for a conventional loan because conventional financing for many condos in on Oahu specifically, it's just not available because it depends on the building's insurance. And so that's been a huge issue that people trying to enter into the condo market or just enter into the housing market, they're not able to get conventional loans. They don't have 35% down. And so that's been a huge struggle. And then on top of that, the maintenance fees are increasing because of the insurance issues, because of the deferred maintenance or you know sprinkler projects, et cetera, elevator needs to be modernized you know, spalling issues need to be addressed. So maintenance fees are so high. So now in the condo market, when we're looking at maintenance fees, we're looking at anything under a thousand is a good deal, you know, and that's mm -hmm. crazy, right? So for mainland buyers that are looking at condos, they're like, really? <laughs> because that's crazy to them, right? They cannot imagine, imagine paying monthly carrying costs like that. So it's, it's difficult for condos. Yeah, well, you know, uh, when you have um, problems in repair, problems in condition, problems that uh, require somebody to spend some money to fix it up, um, you have a great negotiating point, don't you? Uh, I mean, if Absolutely. you're representing the buyer, you come in there with, um, you know, with all kinds of negotiating arguments. And if you're the seller, you better be prepared. In fact, if you're the seller, you ought to get it cleared up before you offer it, right? Tell us about the effect of these repair problems, these issues that Leone was talking about uh, on the transaction, the negotiation of the transaction with and through the broker. You know, especially in uh, recent months, the buyers have become very savvy. So when we're on the list side, we already manage our clients' expectations that pretty much expect the buyer to ask for repairs or credits. And that, that's been the norm. And, and then when we're on the buy side, so if it's going to affect anything, safety, hazard, or health, yes, I think it's a, a proper to ask for credits or repairs. So what's going to happen is, you know, you buy a million dollar property and then there's going to be some negotiation because oftentimes the seller doesn't have money to make those repairs or they don't want to use those funds to, to you know, put in 10, 15, uh, even up to 50,000 to make it completely move and ready, free from many of the uh, problems that would arise in any inspection. So I think that that's where it gets tough. And I wanna say over the last three to four months, there's been more cancellations than, um, than the last couple of years. And also the the sellers in terms of, you know, there's a lot of emotional tolls when it comes to the J1 home inspection period, which is usually between the, the first 10 to 14 days of a transaction. Mm, that enough time? Uh, often it, it's enough time to do the due diligence, hire a home inspector, sewer scope, uh, PV scopes, pool inspectors, but in terms of the actual repairs and fixes, oftentimes it's not. So, so that that's where the buyer and the seller, and that's where we come in as realtors to really negotiate in the best interest. At the same time, how do we make it work for for all the parties? You know, if if you went to Istanbul and you went into um, a market, a bazaar, if you will, and you saw a rug that you liked. And you said to the guy, how much for the rug? And, uh, and he says to you, $500. That's not his real price. Now, I'm not saying this is Istanbul. But if I go in, <laughs> I'm asking Leone's million dollar price. What's, what's the first cut? Does the buyer say, OK, OK, I'll pay a million dollars? Or does the buyer say, hmm, I'll pay half a million dollars? Or does the buyer say, I'll pay $800,000? You know, so if you compare it to Istanbul, uh, what, what's the first counter? It really depends on the neighborhood. I mean, because if it's going to be a desirable neighborhood, like, for example, anything, usually anything in East Oahu. So East Oahu is still super desirable. Certain parts of Milani, for sure, are still desirable, even though it's central. Um, in Metro, Metro Honolulu, pretty desirable still. So if it's going to be in a desirable neighborhood, then for the most part, if a new listing comes on, especially when it's a single family home, because we have a shortage of them, then typically the asking or the list price sometimes can be met or exceeded. And we've seen that even on our recent Kanyohi listing that we sold, you know, we had 
for that one, like nine offers, you know, and it was competitive. And it was almost like those COVID times when homes were flying off the shelf. So it really depends on the property. It depends on the neighborhood, how desirable it is, how appealing it is, if it has a view, if it doesn't have a view, and those types of things. And so uh, oftentimes we're seeing the full list price met by a buyer. And then in other cases, when the property, for whatever reason, sits for a longer time, that's when you see the negotiation come in. And that's when you see buyers coming in and wanting to come on under. For condos, it depends because it depends on the maintenance fees. Sometimes, you know, certain buyers are excluded, like I was talking about earlier, how financially they can't meet it. So sometimes for condos, you'll see something come on and then Oftentimes, condo buyers will come in a little bit lower than full ask, but it depends how desirable that building is, how how much insurance they have, you know, and things like that. And so that kind of is a big factor. So it really, really depends still. But typically for a single family home anywhere in East Oahu, you know, oftentimes, as long as the seller's realistic and what they're asking for, then you'll you'll see the contract price met still. So I also want to cover, you know, the state of the industry, Will. Um, what is the state of the industry? You know, there's so many people in Hawaii who've been involved in real estate and buying and selling real estate uh, over the years. And, you know, the, the it's a substantial, it has been a substantial part of the economy. You're talking about brokers like you guys, um, talking about lawyers, talking about appraisers, talking about banks, you're talking about escrows. And I'm sure there are others, you know, inspectors, whatnot, um, contractors who repair. So where, where do you fit in that landscape? Are you associated with large companies? Are you independent contractors? And where is it all moving? You know, giving, given the, what do you want to call it, the, the, the eclectic and um, evolving nature of the market and the industry, where is the industry going? Great question. So Leonie and I are uh, full-time realtors a husband and wife team. So we're under the uh, national company, Better Homes and Gardens. Uh, but interestingly, I, I think the trend is we've been getting a lot of um, showing requests and offers from these sm very small brokerages, like independent brokerages that we've never heard of. Um, and it, it, when we look it up, it, it seems like they kind of uh, went off on their own within the last two to three years. So it seems like there are more agents just creating their own small brokerages. And that could be happening. Uh, but at the same time, you got to balance the fact that it's always good to have the national backing or the training and the support. So I, I think I do want to kind of quickly get into the NAR lawsuit, if I may. Yeah, please. Okay, so that's the National Association of Realtors lawsuit. Uh, there's a, um, and basically the premise is there was a lawsuit in the state of Missouri and the attorneys claimed that the NAR, the National Association of Realtors and the real estate industry artificially inflated the price of housing and restricted competition by requiring the sellers to pay for the buyer's agent's commission. So that was the lawsuit in a nutshell. And if you may have heard, uh, there was a $418 million settlement between the uh, plaintiffs and the NAR and many of the national brokerages. So as a result, the, uh, you know, the settlement agreement was over 108 pages. That's a lot of pages to read, but when you uh, drill it down, there's only two things that came out of the settlement. And one is that the commissions to the buyer's agents or any type of compensation can no longer be listed on the MLS, that's the multiple listing uh, services system, which all the realtors have access to. And the second thing uh, is the buyers must now sign a buyer's representation contract. So this is all gonna be in effect uh, starting in mid-August, August 17, 2024 to be exact. So those are two big things that's uh, really affecting the industry. The biggest thing is on the when we have uh, sellers, that the first question that they ask is, hey, I heard about the NAR lawsuit. Do we need to pay the buyer's agent's commission, right? And the answer is no, you don't have to. But the ramification could be significantly, or the, there could be unintended consequences. So for example, so if, if you decide not to pay the buyer's agent's commission, one, now the buyer, if the buyer has to pay for their own 
um, agents commission, then that's going to be increasing the cost for the buyers, right? And sometimes they might want like a dual agency. So even though it's legal, oftentimes it's not the most, uh, the best scenario for both the buyers and sellers, because in a dual agency, one agent represents both sides. No one really feels like they were well represented. The second situation um, would be the unrepresented buyer, right? So if, if the buyer cannot afford to pay for the own buyer's agents, then they're like, okay, you know what? I don't need an agent. I'll just buy it by myself. But from a seller standpoint, that's probably even more scarier because yes, you could save on the commission, but what if something goes wrong post-closing? If the buyer is not happy for any reason, then it could come back to the seller. So in some ways, paying commission to the buyer's agent, it's it's almost like a, uh, I call it liability insurance. Mm -hmm. So that, that's one way to look at it. Mm -hmm. Now things are changing. They're changing from all sides. Now one of the things in Hawaii that has always been an issue is we have, we're an island state and we don't have that, that much land. And at the same time, we have big landowners like uh, Kamehameha Schools that owns huge tracts of land. And although that may be, you know, in, in commercial or agricultural land, the fact is that uh, when an appraisal is made, when value is established or, or agreed, when appraisers make their findings, that has an mm -hmm. effect on all the land. And so what you have is um, the cost of occupancy goes up because the industry itself generally seeks a higher valuation. Right. Uh, so, you know, this, this is a bit of a problem. Uh, I, and I'm happy to say that we don't have leasehold very much anymore. But query, um, do, we, do we need to have reform? Do we need to have, Leone, can you tell me about the need for uh, reform in light of the problem, the supply of affordable housing, and the the real fact that in the this island state, um, we are paying too much for occupancy. Your thoughts? You know, I think there's there's the need for a lot of things here in Hawaii. It's it's tough. I mean, the cost of living. So you know, with housing included, housing prices are you know stable. They're not falling or dropping despite the high interest rates. But the cost to live here in Hawaii is crazy, right? To buy a plate lunch is like 20 bucks. Like it's 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 ridiculous and it is hard. And I think that there could be reform work, you know, or some changes or or advantages for what I'm seeing like downtown, for example, is repurposing commercial buildings, making those into residential spaces. But are they really affordable for a, a consumer, right? But I think it actually even goes deeper than that, like even to employment. So there are, you know, we have, there, there's a lot of jobs available here, but they're not very good paying jobs here in Hawaii. And so, you know, um, to your question before, you know, that you had sent us regarding like retail and Amazon and things like that, I'm hoping like maybe there's opportunity there where maybe there are more jobs available for local people that are more attractive, that are pay higher wages so that they can afford to stay and live here. Because I think the housing prices are one part of it, but it's just like, it's the whole cost of living and, and what is it going to take for our local people to be able to continue to stay here and to live? Because I mean, Will and I do it somehow, you know, we're very fortunate and just work really hard, but it just gets harder every day, you know? And I think even when there was a whole housing boom that happened during COVID here in Hawaii where everyone was buying up Hawaii property because of the low interest rates and they were coming in from the mainland. And I kind of wondered about that because I was thinking not only the culture here and everything might be different for a mainland buyer, but I was wondering, you know, when their family member gets sick in the mainland, you know, it's just going to take one thing for them to need to go back and be closer because we are, you know, a plane right away. And we're seeing it happening because a lot of the listings coming on, it's funny, they're, you know, they were originally purchased in 2020, 2021. So I don't know, regarding reform and all of that, I hope there could be changes that could incentivize more affordable housing. I hear there's some groups that are doing really good work and trying to get legislation and everything like that. So we're just really supportive of that because it is extremely hard. Yeah. If uh, everybody leaves town, yeah. that, that has a bad effect on the market. So Will, you know, we have we have um, sort of a flat market right now. I mean, I'll, I'll let Leone's comments stand for themselves. Um, and, and we have a, a world that is in an inflection point in so many ways. I mean, um, nationally, and the government in Washington is a bit of a pickle. 
Um, we have wars, we have threats uh, all over the world that could ripen. Um, we have autocracies, autocracies developing hither and yon. We have the possibility that Donald Trump will be elected and uh, and bring mm, all kinds of new problems, um, you know, to the market. So um, all of that affects this market today. But my question to you is what kind of surprises, what kind of anticipated factors uh, are we talking about over the next six months or a year? I mean, one of them, for example, and you, you guys touched on it, um, is the bell curve. People are getting older. Um, they can't live in, in the family house anymore. Uh, their kids have gone to the mainland. They got to sell. Um, so on the one hand, there's a, there's a huge number of people who want to sell. On the other hand, you have people who may, may not be able to pay the price that these um, seniors have been counting on for their whole lives. You know, they, this is where their assets are in this house. And now they find that there's not a lot of people who are willing to pay what they expect. So my question to you, it's broad, it's broad, Will. Um, what are the factors that we should be looking for in the next six months? Great question. And you know, when it comes to the presidential elections, um, kind of going back to the first President Bush days, in the last eight presidential elections, home prices went up seven out of the last eight presidents. So uh, the, the only exception was back in 2008, you know, the financial crisis. So otherwise, in from a residential standpoint, um, I don't think it's going to affect it very much. I mean, there's always anxiety, you know, what's going to happen with interest rates, taxes. And when it comes to, you know, because every single year, um, there's always a bill introduced to eliminate 1031 exchanges. So I think from a tax perspective, you know, tax always change or almost always change depends on, de depending on the, the election, the new president. So I feel like when it comes to luxury markets, and investment properties, those are going to be the most affected when it comes to uh, uh, election uh, election periods. Um, and when it comes to mortgage interest rates, I think we look back to the last uh, 10 or 11 presidential elections, and eight of the 11 times, the mortgage interest rates went down. Uh, there's only three times that it went up. So... Um, I think overall, um, even though there's a lot of um, noise in the news, in the end, I don't think there's going to be too many changes in 2025, especially in Hawaii. Are you assuming which guy gets elected? Either one. Regardless of, of yeah, re regardless of um, who gets elected, in, in terms of the uh, the effect on the inventory, the prices. Um, because, you know, last year, a lot of our buyers were on hold, but they realized, okay, interest rates are not going down. The prices are not going down. So now there's a lot of more buyer pool, actually, uh, and not enough inventory. And I think that's going to continue next year because even the economists, they're not predicting interest rates to go down below 6% anytime soon. Mm -hmm. If it does, that's great, right? But if it doesn't, I think that's, that, that is the actual norm now. So if you go to the journalism program in the School of Communications at UH Manoa and you ask them, what is the most important story in our lifetime? Uh, they will say it's climate change, it's sea level rise, especially in Hawaii. Um, and so, you know, for example, over time, we know there will be sea level rise. Uh, right. And property, properties along, along the beach are gonna, you know, have issues and we know um, that um, there will be extreme weather. It's only a matter of time. Every beautiful day in Hawaii is one day closer uh, to the next extreme. And we've seen what happens on the mainland uh, in areas that are affected. They're pummeled um, by floods and droughts and all that other stuff. I mean, sea level rise, climate change is emerging as a significant feature all over the world. Um, mm -hmm. And luckily, we haven't had that issue not 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 in in our not in the center of our lives, but mm, it, it's going to happen. So how do you wrap around that? Suppose I'm a um, a buyer, and I say, "Will, what what do I do about climate change? How do I how do I build in around that?" Yeah. So 
In 2017, they did a study regarding the sea level rise. So in Hawaii, they're, um, they're saying the next 80 to 100 years, the, uh, there's going to be a sea level rise of up to 3.2 feet. So in terms of that, I think it was big news in the beginning, but there are still people buying beachfront properties and oceanfront properties. And I think equally concerning is if a property is in a flood zone, whether it's VE, um, AE, or V, one of the more significant um, flood zones. So I think in terms of the climate change, um, whether it's you know hurricane insurance, um, it see appears to affect more from an insurability standpoint at this point because you know when they read the report we give it to our buyer clients and it's like 80 to 100 years away it's like their comment is well i might not be alive but at the same time i mean if that if you want that to be your legacy property then yeah it, it could actually be a consideration so i think for now in terms of sea level rise it hasn't turn off the buyers who were intending to buy, you know, beach from properties or properties that are very close to the beach. I, I think it's more affecting from a insurability standpoint um, and getting loans for, for people who, you know, can't pay cash. So Leone, you know, you mentioned um, that part of your portfolio um, are um, buyers that come from faraway places, uh, the mainland. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I can imagine somebody in a in a state which is suffering from climate change uh, would want to come out here because so far we look pretty good, yeah. uh, unless you look back at our history when we had some bad storms, um, or our future uh, where we have the sea level rise that uh, you know uh, we're talking about. So the, the question: is, uh, What do you say to them? What do you say to them when they come here? And they say, "What is the future of the real estate market in Hawaii?" What do you say to the people from the mainland, from Europe, uh, and from Asia, of course, who, for various reasons, want to get their money out of Asia? Right. I think that, you know, a lot of people, we kind of explain to them about the culture and the way that things are here, although it is, you know, changing. It's definitely different from when I was little growing up here. But generally, from, a, from our climate, I mean, there are a lot of risk factors coming up. Beachfront properties, you know, might not be something of interest. Um, it's it's becoming less and less of interest to a lot of buyers unless they really want to be in front of a sandy beach. But there are so many issues with that. So regarding the climate change and all of the aspects that, you know, I think the whole world is kind of facing that too, not just specific to Hawaii. And so when they're looking at coming here, we we have those discussions, we show them if they're looking at specific properties, we look at the sea level rise map together and talk through the issues. There's always going to be the threat of hurricanes and all, all kinds of other natural disasters. The, the fire, you know, the fires on Maui, that was something that we, I don't think, any of us have really seen here in Hawaii before. So there's all kinds of potentials. But I think that from wherever they're coming from, whether it's international or across the US, everyone is at risk, you know, to a certain degree to, to different things. And at least here, you know, we don't have like super harsh winters or it's pretty consistent. So I think that is a draw for a lot of buyers and, you know, kind of tagging on to what Will was saying, the buyer profile that we're seeing, they're super savvy. Um, they've done the research also a lot of times on their end. And so they're coming into this kind of knowing what they're getting into, but they don't know all the details. So we help them with that. What do you do to mitigate? What do you do to mitigate um, the risks that people are asking about? I mean, for example, um, as you said, um, near near the water, mm -hmm. that's a different situation given a sea level rise. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe near any water course, it's a different situation in the possibility of floods. Um, and um, I suppose there are different issues, different risks for different kinds of neighborhoods, properties, topography, um, Oahu versus neighbor island, and so forth. So if if the buyer comes to you and he mm -hmm. says, "Look, I, I I recognize there are issues all over the over the world, the mainland, uh, everywhere you look, it's a global problem, but I want to get into real estate. I want my money safe. Uh, I, I don't want to lose the property that I buy." Mm -hmm. What neighborhoods, what topography, what locations uh, stand out? What what would you, you know, suggest to that potential buyer? 
Yeah, I hear you. And I think we have buyers like that in that exact profile. So we start to look at things like, well, said flood zone. So we're looking for flood zone X or D, you know, something that is not going to be as at risk for a flood. Even AE, I mean, that you're going to still have to get the flood insurance, but it's a 1% chance annually. So they say, right. So we're looking at flood zones. We're looking for ones that are perhaps not at risk for at least that part of it. And then we're looking at maybe the construction of the home, maybe something that's not single wall, right? And a lot of um, mainland buyers and even foreign buyers are like, they're, they're, they, they're very unfamiliar with single wall sometimes, like they have not seen that before. So we have to explain the risks of that. And so maybe we look for double wall construction or concrete, you know, or something like that. And so it really kind of depends. We don't, we kind of will look at property or recommend property that are going to be maybe less risky or, you know, less potential. And it based on their parameters, because what they're looking for, like if they're looking for, you know, a 10 bedroom home or something, there's only limited supply of that. And so there's only certain ones that we're going to be looking for. So it really depends on what they're looking for. And in terms of the climate, you know, we can kind of make recommendations that are going to maybe help satisfy some of their concerns, but there's no guarantees, right? I mean, we cannot control what what natural disasters may or may not come our way. Things are changing every day with that, but we do try our best to mitigate and help them to select the right place in the right neighborhood that, you know, hopefully min minimizes the risk, but there's still always going to be that risk. And even in the valleys, right, where you would think like it's safe and dry and things like that, there's, there's, you know, drainage issues and, and floods that can result from that, or there's king tides that can come in that, you know, you never anticipated. So there's a lot of factors. And so we try to kind of look at property and really kind of identify what all the risks are. And the main thing is that they're informed because there's typically a solution, you know, even for flooding, there's solutions. You can do grading on the property. You could put in drains. You could do things to help try to mitigate that risk. You can elevate the home, you know, to make sure that it's going to be there for years to come if it's a legacy property. But basically those are what we try to do is identify any kind of issue that you might see on a property so the buyer is aware of it and then they know what the solutions are going to be and what the cost is going to be for them to remedy those issues yeah well um you know we, we're going to wrap up here in a minute but will i want to ask you where where this is all going for example i i would be very surprised to find that any buyer would be interested in, in leasehold these days i remember a, a situation where a buyer from the mainland um, he wanted to buy a, a condo and there was a, a leasehold, it was a leasehold condo. And he said, look, I'm not, I'm not looking for my lifetime. I'm looking for my, my progeny, my, my children, my grandchildren, um, and how wrong he was because the landlord took it back, um, even during his lifetime. And so leasehold is pretty threatening if you have any long-term view of the situation you don't know. What the landlord is going to do, and some of those, some of those long-term leases are really draconian. I'm sure you've seen them. So that's one thing. And the other thing is, um, you know, these these units that we're talking about, condo units, and for that matter, homes, seem to me to be getting smaller. Yeah, you you know, per foot you're paying more, and the result is that um, some of these condos are you know really small, but the price is really low. And uh, I'm thinking that over time, we're going to find um, that condo units and maybe homes too on the market are going to be smaller. So those are two trends I see. What do you see? What do you see about the long-term trends uh, in this market? So, you know, to address um, your first question regarding the leasehold, yeah, I mean, we, we, Almost rarely, in fact, we don't recommend leasehold properties to our clients. So oftentimes we will get a call saying, oh my God, I could get this uh, two bedroom condo unit in Kahala for 150,000, right? But then the, the lease expires in 2027 for the Kahala Beach Hotel. So you're owning it for only like three years and you're going to lose the property. That's it. So I, I think, you know, having a better understanding of leasehold properties with that said, um, there are still quite a few number of buyers who are looking at leasehold properties because on the listing side, we have sold leasehold and co-op properties. And, you know, oftentimes if the, the banks won't loan on it, 
unless you have at least 30 years remaining on the lease. But, you know, people who are elderly, who, you know, like, like you were saying, maybe, you know, they, they don't have beneficiaries and they just want a more a fixed permanent rent. And, and that that's what you're doing. Um, and for a condo that's leasehold, you also have to worry about maintenance fees because uh, uh, maintenance fees increase every single year. Uh, the lease rent, when it's renegotiated, then it'll also increase. So um, leasehold in some situation might make sense, but in most, it, it's better to try to save up money for a, a feasible property. And in terms of the hot topics, of course, the climate change, I think affordable uh, housing is probably one of the most talked about uh, topics in legislation. And I think, uh, you know, people always say, okay, let's just build more houses. And, you know, especially with a new short-term rental law, the rezoning situation, the Maui mayor is talking about rezoning 7,000 short-term rentals into long-term housing. And there could be constitutional implications of that. But I think even more basics, I um, you know, the building permit procedure, I mean, it's taking too long. One of our clients who has a vacant lot, they finally got their permit approved after two years. So I think um, I've heard, we've both heard that it's supposed to improve with a new system, but you have, oftentimes when it's a new system, you gotta take a couple of steps back before it improves. So I think we have to go back to the basics and how do we build and how do we get our building permit process, you know, faster and more expeditious? Absolutely, very important point. Thank you for that. So, Leone, um, you know, wh where is this industry going? Is this a, a lifelong thing uh, for you guys? Is is this a lifelong thing for your friends and colleagues in the business? Where is it going for the, the brokers, the lawyers, the appraisers, the banks, the escrows, and for that matter, the property managers who are involved in all these projects? Is this something that you would tell your kid or your hmm, your family to get into? Or is this something you would tell your kid or your family not to get into? Um, <laughs> look, look, look forward and tell me what you think is where it's going to go as, as a way to spend your occupational time. Well, thanks for the question. I mean, for us right now, honestly, we're taking it one day at a time because we just put one foot in front of the other and having five children that we're also responsible for and running our family and things. That's kind of the way we the way we live, just one day at a time, you know, so that's what it seems like. Um, regarding the future, you know, of our industry locally, it right now, I'm watching it carefully. And it seems like it almost could be business as usual. So we'll see if that theory is true. There are some changes that are coming up because of the lawsuits. And I would say that when I look at the membership count of how many people are staying in real estate, it's not like a huge drop off. And, you know, right now we're going for realtors, we're going through our MLS renewals and MLS renewals seem to be on par. So it's not like there's a huge drop off. But what I am seeing in the industry is that because of the busier time during COVID, the so-called housing boom or whatever it was, but, you know, that blip when the interest rates are so low, there was a lot of staff put into escrow and title in lending, a lot of lenders. And so those those businesses are, are hurting a little bit more because they had staffed up and they were handling a lot of refinances as well as purchases. And so those, you know, business has shrunk for them. And so I do see that being a little bit slower, but for their, our go-to home inspectors, they seem to still be busy. It's not easy to get an appointment still. Like we have to wait and plan ahead. Um, surveyors, same thing. And so certain industry people, for property managers, it is so difficult. Like they seem to be um, pretty busy. So a lot of our go-to property management companies, they are, they're, they're still cranking. And it is really hard to find, you know, good trusted resources for property management, but it seems like their businesses are flourishing and it's a more stable thing, right? Because you have the tenants and it's it's for a specified, you know, usually long-term period of time and things like that. So the property management industry seems to be okay, except for I'm sure they're combating the same thing that we are on the sales side with the aging condos and all of the issues with the associations and those types of matters. So so we'll see. But I mean, right now for us, at least as we look forward to the next year or two, it seems like business as usual. 
And it seems like something in terms of our kids getting involved, we're trying to get my son involved. He just graduated from high school and we're just trying to get him to help us with some odds and ends things. And getting a 17 year old to do anything is very difficult, Jay. No, I agree with her. In terms of um, our real estate business, I think we're all in for, for the long term. I mean, th there's no backup plan. This, this is all we do 24 seven. And our kids have seen it. Our parents have seen us. So, um, you know, working seven days a week. I, I love working with my wife. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much. Real Tanaka, uh, the only lamb for this discussion and, and uh, all of the, the points you've made and the suggestions you've made. Really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Aloha. <laughs>